In the last episode, we had just arrived at Marina Park Motril in Motril, Spain, when the lockdown in Spain from the coronavirus had prevented us from moving any further. We ended up really enjoying our three month stay in Marina Park Motril as we met lifelong friends and we were able to complete a lot of boat projects, including installing our new Jenniker sail. But after three months of isolation, Amazon deliveries, and several projects, the diligent mask wearing in Spain was paying off and the country was starting to open up in phases. Signs of life in businesses was starting to come back as they were allowed to open under new restrictions. Even the marina was slowly starting to put boats back into the water for its customers. And so it was time for us to slowly and safely venture out for groceries and start to explore the area. A quick 10 minute scooter ride takes us from the marina to the center of Motril. This coastal area is known as the tropical coast because of its subtropical microclimate and many of the vegetables consumed throughout Europe are produced in this area of Spain. So in Spain, when you order a beer, they serve you a little tapas. You don't choose it, it just comes. And this is kind of weird, this is a hot rock. This is one of the largest parks in Motril and it's dedicated to showing the history of the sugar cane that was grown in the region. They've also dedicated the landscaping to trees from the Americas, such as the jacaranda and the swamp cypress. The two most common items in the supermarket is cheese and ham. The ham is usually bought by the leg and is lovely, and the cheese comes in millions of types. I'm not quite sure how to choose it yet, but I think eventually we'll get there. After a quick trip to the laundry, we make our way back to the marina to find some spotter planes out gathering water to put out some local fires. After introducing us to the local rum, our new friend Javier offered to take us on a tour of the distillery, which happened to be just down the road from the marina. I'm always on the lookout for a good rum as it's my favorite, and this rum is highly, highly recommended. It's a family-run business, uh, started about 60 years ago out of the local sugarcane industry that surrounded the area. They perform the entire process of gathering raw materials through production and into final distribution. Their rum truly is uniquely smooth, and they're explaining during the tour that this is due to the fact that they have a very exact multi-stage distillation process, where they take off a portion that's not good enough for the rum and use it for other industrial processes. Their aging process is also unique in that they age in new barrels and they age for much longer than other typical rum companies. As it's a family-run business, we instantly felt welcome and part of the family, especially since the owners found us afterwards on the docks of the marina to say hi and to welcome us to the community. And afterward, we drove down the coast to have a beautiful lunch overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. The restaurant we stopped at was near a marina, and we stopped there to taste the local delicacy, arroz negro. I've never, never tried octopus ink. I have to enjoy the life, because I don't know the future. It's a garlic, olive, olive oil and salt and a little vinagre. We are really honored that Javier shared his appreciation of the region with us and we're still humbled by all the kindness and generosity given to us by all of the Spanish friends that we met while we've been here. 
There's really a multitude of beautiful places to stop along the Spanish coastline that look very similar to this, places to anchor and to enjoy a few nights on the boat. We are going to the Alpujarra and we are going to visit the different uh, city. About an hour's drive north of Motril is Alpujarra. The area with its collection of villages is located in the southern part of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. One of the unique things about this region is the availability of water. The Moors were the originators of the water collection system, which runs throughout these old villages and was collecting the snowmelt that would come off of the Sierra Nevada mountain ranges. And this creates a very green region in contrast to the browner regions surrounding it. Pampanera is the first village that you reach as you ascend through the region. A lot of the architecture with the whitewashed buildings still are remnants of the Moorish times when they settled there back before the 1500s. It's not a uh, white uh, paint. paint, it's cal. Oh, yeah. Cal. It's more uh, clear, more um, whiter. And here you can see the ancient water delivery system that was used to deliver the snow melt from the mountains down to the people living in the village. And continuing on this water theme, we have the San Antonio Fountain, where legend has it, if you drink from it, you will find your true love. Shall I drink some then? You don't have any gravity. Don't, don't drink, don't drink. No, but I was thinking about some extra girlfriend. You gotta drink the right one. It's good. Moving onward to the highest village we'll see today, which is the Trevolet village. But before we get there, we're going to make a pit stop to see some more spring water that's coming off the Sierra Mountains. Javier called this water ferro water or iron water, which is what lends the color to the areas that are touched by the spring water. And these four taps putting out different levels of iron and other minerals are used for medicinal purposes for some people to cure such things as anemia. Whoa! It's like a special drink. Mm -hmm. It's like Coca-Cola. And up to the village of Treveleth, which happens to be famous for its ham, and also is the highest village in mainland Spain. And when it's time for lunch, we make our way back down to another village called Capolera, which is another beautiful village and rounding out a great day in the mountains. Okay, we're uh, driving up to Granada to visit the Alhambra and uh, the marina manager and owner, Roberto, has lent us his Range Rover to do that. So we're a little bit feeling a little bit humbled by that. We've never really experienced generosity and hospitality like we have received in Spain. Scootering around downtown uh, Granada. And some of the stone buildings here are really magnificent. So we reached Alhambra and we're starting our tour with our scooters here. We got here no problem, thanks to Roberto. 
The Alhambra was built by the Nazarid Muslim sultans during the final period of Muslim rule in Andalusia. It was built and used in the 13th to 15th centuries before being taken over by the Christians in 1492. The sultans wanted a private and secure place to reside outside of the general public and they actually renovated an old fortress which was already there from the 9th century. The three primary regions within the Alhambra are the Medina for the tradespeople and all the support people within, the Alcazaba for the military and guard, and the palaces where the royal family would live. The Medina or the town within the Alhambra is the most populated area consisting of the residences, workshops, administrative buildings, bathhouses, and markets. The oldest part of the Alhambra is the Alcazaba. It's the military district which was built first in order to defend the Alhambra. It has plenty of watchtowers to look out over into the city and that's where the Sultan's elite guard would reside. In the royal palace area there are three royal palaces each built in the 1300s and each built by a different Sultan. The first and oldest palace, or the Meshuar, they think it was originally used for bureaucratic tasks such as judicial items and council meetings. Throughout the palaces you can see both the Muslim architecture mixed in with the Christian architecture that followed soon after. For example, the Christians renovated this room to add the choir on the second floor and the pillars of Hercules flanking the concept of a chapel in this room. The second of the three palaces is the Comoras, and they believe that the large chamber of ambassadors was used to receive foreign delegations. This is an amazingly perfectly cubic room where the walls are adorned with this plaster work finely detailed with tapestries and inscriptions and symbols. The final palace to be built was the Palace of the Lions, built by Muhammad V. This courtyard is the most ornate because it's bordered by 124 marble columns connected by arches, and each of them are decorated with plaster panels intricately detailed. The floor is laid completely with marble tiles, and in the center sits the water fountain with the lions, 12 lions around it, representing royal power. Also, it's believed that the four channels of water emerging from the fountain represent the four rivers of the Muslim paradise. One of the most fascinating things about the Alhambra palaces is the mathematical complexity employed in the interior design. They adorn their interior walls and ceilings with plaster, tile, and wood. The plaster work of finely detailed inscriptions, poems, and symbols runs up to the ceiling typically covering every inch of available wall space. Originally, they carved the plaster with a chisel, but then they later they used wooden molds to pour the stucco into and then attach them to the wall. The pinnacle of their plaster work was the merkarnas, the ornamental vaulted ceilings. They completed these geometrically symmetrical octagon ceilings with polyhedrons, aligning them perfectly in 3D space. Another specialty on display was the carpentry used to create the elaborate lattices, doors, windows, and ceilings. They inlaid contrasting wood types as well as other materials to create depth and texture in their woodwork. And lastly, the ceramics illustrate the command they had over geometric mathematics. Molds were also employed here using various colors that had special meaning to them. Green meant the prophet, yellow means the sun, blue is the sky or paradise, and red is blood, war, or love. The geometric patterns in the Alhambra display all the 17 mathematically possible wallpaper groups or the mathematical classifications of a two-dimensional repetitive pattern.
After 1492, when the Catholics moved in, the monarchs used the Alhambra as their residence when visiting Granada. They continued building and making changes to suit their needs, and Charles V also commissioned lodging for himself here and his family, though it was never used by him. It was finished in the Western style and looks completely different from the rest of the palaces. In his later years, Charles V wanted a more permanent residence located within the Alhambra, and in 1527 he commissioned another palace there, although it never really quite finished due to some political instabilities and budget issues. Just outside and adjacent to the Alhambra is the Tejena Relief, and that is an, basically a leisure resort for the royals to use to get away from the bureaucratic day to day within their palaces. They would use this estate for agriculture, hunting, and simple leisure. One of the important engineering feats was bringing water to all parts of the Alhambra, and they built a canal with a series of reservoirs and wells to distribute water throughout the Alhambra, and the original canal that was built in the 1300s is still in use today. We feel fortunate that we were able to see this World Heritage Site. We went during the first open day due to the virus and they restricted the number of people that could enter. So we pretty much had the place to ourselves. We're grateful that we were able to see such a beautiful place. In this episode, the system we're going to be covering is the paddle wheel transducer and how to maintain it. So one of the items in our checklist is to clean the paddle wheel and the transducer uh, so that the boat speed will read something greater than zero. Uh, it's been reading zero so we know it's stuck with some growth from sitting in the marina for so long. So the paddle wheel transducer is located in the master bedroom under this floorboard. So first we lift this up and down here is the transducer, the paddle wheel transducer, which is located next to a bilge pump. This paddle wheel transducer is a three in one sensor. Uh, the three functions that it measures are the water temperature, the depth to the seabed, and also the speed of the boat through the water. So now we're gonna remove the paddle wheel transducer and clean it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I've got my knee pads on because we're gonna be here for a little while. And I'm just gonna undo this uh, plastic nut here. And I'm gonna pull it straight out. And there's a couple of uh, O-rings in here, so it's water tight right now. But there is nothing to stop water coming through this pipe into the boat. So you have to pull it out fairly sharpish and stick your hand over it like this. And then oh, gross. look at that. So it's covered in crud in there. From sitting stationary in the water for so long, the paddle wheel was prevented from freely moving from a buildup of general sea creatures and also a calcification. Here we're plugging the hole with a wooden bung, but that didn't work very well. There was still some leakage around the sides. So I had a backup option to fill the hole again with a blank plug that screwed in and stopped all of the leakage so that we could take our time to give the paddle wheel a good cleaning. The Seagoo was jammed in pretty tight and initially I was going to use Peter's toothbrush to clean it out, but that didn't work so well. So in the end, a fondue fork did the trick as the best tool to reach in between the grooves. Mm -hmm. 
and then with some final brushing between the wheels it was able to come clean enough so that it could move freely in the future. It's like getting a deep cleaning at the dentist. <laughs> yeah. Need one of those ultrasonic. Well, we got the pretty girl doing the cleaning. Okay, rinse. This won't hurt a bit. Rinse. Okay. I think that's it. That's pretty good. Okay, time to shove it back in. So it's feeling pretty greasy. There's a lot of silicone grease on there. Ordinarily, I would put some more silicone grease. Actually, why don't we just do that? So that's the little paddle wheel thing that whizzes around pushed around by the water and what was stopping it was a what appeared to be a jellyfish that was stuck in there so the paddle wheel there's a little bit of crustacea in there the way it works is it's got a tiny little magnet in there and then a little hall effect sensor which can detect when the magnet is close and it will just count the number of rotations. It's a very crude but simple way. So there's no contacts. All you need is a little magnet and the contacts are inside this black plastic with the little Hall effect sensor is. After lubricating the O-ring and screwing it back into place, we just monitor it a few hours later to make sure that it's not leaking. And here we have to make sure that it's installed correctly facing the right way. So here, when you install it, this arrow has to point in the direction that you want the boat to sense the speed through the water. In other words, it has to be directly ahead. Kind of obvious, but it's kind of a mistake I would make. The last thing is the removal of the jellyfish guts. As there was a diver on site at the Marina Park Motril, and also since the boat had been sitting for so long, we decided to have the diver come and clean the hull of the boat. It's only about an hour or two process and relatively inexpensive. And this time we were able to give him the GoPro to get some images of the, the hull before the cleaning and then compare it with after the cleaning. So here you see um, images of the propeller and the growth on it as well as the anodes around the propeller. In total, there are six anodes. Uh, three of them are on the propeller, and you can see here that it's time for us to change them, and you'll see that in a future video. Two of the anodes are on the skeg keel, and the final anode is on the centerboard. So now that we have these two scooters, we were thinking we could put them in the sail locker and sure enough they did fit. 
Uh, what Peter had to do was drill some holes, uh, two tiny holes, so that we could um, fix them to the sidewalls of the sail locker. And they fit really snugly and nicely when we're underway. Even when we are sailing upwind and the bow is moving a lot, they're, they're super secure. So it's the perfect place to store them. You can see that we also use large soft carabiners uh, hanging in the sail locker to hang our fenders uh, so that we don't have to crawl down to the bottom of the sail locker to fetch them. After a trip to the hypermarket in Motril to provision, uh, it was finally time to leave and say goodbye to all of our friends. And we've put together a video here for Marina Park Motril showing all the facilities and services that they offer. In the next episodes, we're going to be heading slowly up the coast to Cartagena and then over to the Balearic Islands. We're also going to be testing out our new Jenniker sail and reviewing its performance. <laughs> <laughs>